it is a huge honor for me to be able to join you in welcoming Dr. Leah Samuel into her new role leading uh, the social and emotional learning field, I dare say, as the CEO of CASEL and as uh, our leader uh, now in the weeks and months ahead in the critical work of trying to respond to the needs of our kids, our children, our students, our families, our teachers. Uh, so much need, uh, so much to do, and such an extraordinary leader to join us uh, at this particular moment. Let me just say by way of background, um, this is an extraordinary time in the field of social and emotional learning in, the, in, in, in all of our related and closely aligned fields. Uh, we set out many, many years ago to build a field that was grounded in child development, that was paradigm shifting in the way in which we thought about the relationship between emotions, relationships, and cognitive development. We set out to build a field that was strongly grounded in the evidence with action researchers at the center and strongly grounded in the real life challenges of children teachers and educators and practitioners at the center. We set out to build a field that would be strength-based and not deficit-based, that would respond with a prevention focus that was linked to treatment and support services. We set out to build a field that would be grounded in parental engagement and in youth-serving organizations that would partner with schools. We set out to build a field that would align all of the complexity in schools, all of the many distracting and sometimes confusing programming into a singular focus around the combined efforts to develop the social, emotional, and academic lives of children. I say all that because as maybe complex as that all seems, we have, I believe, an extraordinary leader who understands all of it. And while uh, this is a ever-changing field, uh, I am so proud that we have, uh, we've been able to win Dr. Samuel to this position. We've been able to invite her to take this leadership role at this critical time. I think you all know uh, Dr. Samuel has a doctorate in uh, literacy related work and development. She's been uh, the head of educational policy at National Governors Association. She's been the executive vice president at NWEA. She's a fellow at Harvard. She's been in the United States Department of Education. She's been in schools. Uh, the bridging of research and policy and the everyday requirements of doing the complex paradigm shifting work of changing and making our schools more as responsive as they can possibly be, she has done all of those. And so it's my great honor to welcome Dr. Samuel to this role. You can see I'm in a t-shirt, not because it's warm here, it's freezing, uh, but because it's my only castle branded piece of uh, clothing and Aliyah and I decided we would try to get our castle blues together. Welcome Aliyah and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Tim. You know, it really is an honor and every time I hear my bio read, it's so humbling to me. And the reason why it's humbling is because at the core of who I am and what I believe in is that I'm an educator. I'm just a pure educator who has felt the need to use my voice and experience to be a voice for so many people who have not been heard, who, who don't feel like they're heard or, or that have had a seat at the table. And so it really is an honor um, to be with you today, to be a part of the castle team, to proudly wear this beautiful castle blue. And, um, you know, I just want to share a little bit as to what, why I came to this role. And I have to start off with my three Ps. I, I often like to explain that for me, as I sum up my work, as I sum up my goal in leadership, it's grounded in being a practitioner a parent and a policy influencer. So on the practitioner side, and I, I start with them in that order because that's really the order how they've happened in my life. I started off as a public school educator in Hillsborough County. I actually cut my teeth in education, teaching special education. And I actually taught emotionally at the time, the term was emotionally handicapped kids. And as an educator, I mean, on the ground, you see the realities of what teachers do every day and how much we take on in order to best help our students and families that we serve. And I was in public education as a practitioner for almost 10 years. I was an uh, elementary uh, special ed teacher. I then went on to teach general ed. Um, 
with an inclusive classroom and then went on to become an assistant principal and principal. And during my principalship, I became a parent. I have two young sons in elementary school. Um, and yes, I have been parenting in this pandemic like so many parents. I had, uh, when the pandemic started, my youngest was a kindergartner and my oldest was a third grader. Um, and then in, in really seeing education, not only from the practitioner lens, but as a parent lens, really was a transitional point for me. And I realized and started to see firsthand the impact that policy had on people's lives. And I also started to realize how few educators were at the policy table actually informing and lending their voice to the policy discussions. And so um, when my son, my oldest son was six months old, I transitioned from a principalship into the policy world. And it has been one amazing ride. I never in a million years thought that uh, using my voice as a policy, um, as a parent and a practitioner would be an opportunity to really become a policy influencer. And I've had an opportunity to testify before Congress. Um, I've had an opportunity to work with almost every single governor's office. I've actually traveled to every state capital except for two. I only have two more on my list, working directly with governor's offices and state leaders. And uh, I even had an opportunity to work um, with the Secretary of Education in reopening schools. And, and I'm often asked, well, Leah, you've done all of these things. Why, why join CASEL? And through every transition in my career, I've always felt like it was a call and an answer to the field. And I'll explain a little bit what I mean by that. My last two and a half months at the department, I was in over eight states talking to and hosting roundtables and listening sessions with parents, school personnel of all types, students, um, local policymakers, state policymakers trying to understand the challenges and the realities of reopening schools. And fundamentally, the one of the most consistent things I heard from the field was how social emotional learning was impacting the reopening plans, how social emotional learning was impacting the academics and the recovery and moving from uh, the pandemic phase to moving into a recovery phase. And after I, you know, I, I don't even remember what number conversation it was. I was actually in Atlanta, Georgia, hosting a series of roundtables with uh, HBCU students. And I was traveling with the undersecretary when I found out about this role. And here were college students talking about this, their social and emotional impacts in schools. So whether it was early childhood, K-12, post-secondary, the need was so great. And I felt that all of the experiences that I've had and, and, and I've had from the field was really an opportunity to lead and guide in a time um, when we know SEL is so critical, not only to the short-term success of our students and our communities and our country, but long-term success as well. And so that, that's really what drew me here. And I have been so fortunate to be um, welcomed by an amazing board, the staff has been amazing, and I'm really looking forward to rolling up my sleeves and moving, helping to continue to move the work ahead. And so um, all the while, this might be my first introduction. Is that, apologies, the first introduction to all of you. Um, it certainly won't be the last, and I look forward to ongoing conversations and dialogue in the work ahead. So with that, I'll, Tim, I'll turn it over yeah, to you. Yeah, so, um... Dr. Samuel, I first of all, thank you for that. Uh, I think uh, the chat is exploding. I can't keep up. I'm trying, but I, I won't. Uh, I'm going to stop trying. But I do want to invite folks uh, because I was a little delinquent. You know, in, in our field, we try to practice uh, the qualities, the gifts, the skills, the values, the the uh, the orientation, the attitudes of that help us develop and strengthen our social relationships, our self-regulation, our decision-making skills our ethical and moral uh, compasses. Uh, but we didn't do an exercise to start. So I'm gonna take this moment after you've all had a chance to hear uh, from Dr. Samuel initially, I'm gonna take this moment to invite people in the chat to a little exercise. Uh, we're not interested in material exchanges here, but I'm gonna invite you if you're comfortable to share a gift 
uh, with Dr. Samuel uh, that she's going to need for the journey ahead. Maybe uh, uh, a quality, just a word, some word that describes uh, a quality that you want to, in effect, give, um, if I can put it that way, to Dr. Samuel uh, for her journey in this role. Um, and I, uh, when we talked about this, we said, well, we don't know what we're going to get if we ask that. And that's exactly the point. We, 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 there's a thousand people on this and many thousands more will hear from you uh, when they watch the recording, uh, Aaliyah, later. But I thought it would be wonderful for our entire field, in a sense, to have just one moment where we come together and share all the gifts that this field has given to us with you. So in the chat, as you're, as you're comfortable, I uh, invite you to, to post words or phrases or expressions or gifts you'd like to give uh, to Dr. Samuel uh, as she sets off on this journey. And she's going to need all of us. Uh, uh, Dr. Samuel, you know, this is a moment with demand skyrocket. Uh, it's coming from lots of different directions. Um, can you sh say a little bit more based on your experience about where you see uh, the opportunities with this growing demand and maybe even the risks at the same time? What, what, what should we collectively be paying attention to uh, in this moment uh, as, we, as, as, the, as it, it seems schools all over the country as you've just described and teachers and parents and, and young people themselves are asking, give us more. What are the risks and the opportunities in your view right now? Yeah, so, you know, I'll start off um, by saying there's two, I think there's two big risks. And one is how political the field has become. We see the SEL is being talked about and social emotional learning is being talked about in so many different ways. And in part, because there is a lack of understanding about what social emotional learning is how it plays out in the classroom, how it plays out in sports, how it plays out with adults. And I think using this opportunity to really clarify what social emotional learning is, is a critical piece. And I think it will help to um, remove some of the political nature and the, the, the ping pong that SEL is getting caught up in when we can really clarify what it is and also explain and provide examples of how it shows up and be able to amplify the stories that we know are so critical. And I think we run a risk uh, of um, continuing to be put in the spotlight, so to speak, if in a negative way, if we don't help clarify what SEL is. And with that, part of um, what I think SEL is getting entangled with is the mental health conversation and mental well being conversation. And I think, in addition to clarifying what SEL is, also being very clear on the role of SEL as well as the role that mental health and mental well being play, because we really need all three collectively, but SEL is very different. I also think that because there is such a recognition and demand for SEL, also level setting that it's not the quick fix. It's not going to fix in short order what's going on, but it will put us on the pathway to recovery, which we know is going to be a long-term process. I mean, we are you know, I, I still laugh at when I when we thought the pandemic would be over by like summer, June. Oh, you know, by the, by June we'll be out of this. But we are now two, three years into this, and we still don't really know the long term impacts. And I think SEL plays a really critical role in the long term recovery conversation, but it's not going to be that quick fix. And so I think those are some of the risks that we run into. But with that said, there's a huge opportunity. I mean, there's not an educator, there's not a parent out there and parents who understand what SEL is, because I do think we've, in the education world, we use our education jargon and sometimes we lose people um, it, with our educator speak, but when you really unpack what SEL is, parents are very much in support of what SEL is. And so I think there's just a real opportunity to not only bring the field along, but also parents and, and those that we serve as well. 
Yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I'm sure. Well, first of all, I just got to say, I just, <laughs> I, I said I wasn't going to look at the chat, but I was just looking at the gifts you've been given. It's like the most beautiful word graph I think I've ever seen in a chat or in any uh, anything in my life almost. It's just gorgeous. So thanks everyone for joining in the giving of all these qualities and attributes and gifts and affirmations and insights uh, to Dr. Samuel. Uh, I, I hope we can not only just put it in the chat, I'm gonna maybe make it an additional request that we really intentionally look at that language and those words and try to hold those in our interactions with each other. Uh, this is a tough time, Leah, you've referred to the politics. Many of our teachers, parents, school board members, superintendents, administrators, uh, kids are really in uh, hurting over the political tension. Uh, that's in this in the system around us, but also now within our schools and within our school districts more in a more accentuated way. And you, you mentioned parents. Uh, I wonder if you just expand a little bit. You're a mom, you're a parent, uh, you've worked with parents. Um, somehow, I find this confusing. Parents have been seen as being uh, uh, SEL has been seen as being opposed or in some way uh, against parents or parent engagement. I mean, I, I don't want, this is not about me, but the, you know, the first set of issues that I was training with Dr. Comer a hundred years ago was parent engagement was the core, the, you know, the central feature of what SEL and what social competence and child development needed to do in schools. How do we disentangle the politics here and get back to the basics of empowering parents and making the politics less about who gets elected and more about how who gets educated. Yeah, so I think number one is we need to be really intentional with making sure parents are at the table. And yes, as a as a proud parent of two kiddos in public school, I will say that SEL is parent engagement. SEL is absolutely grounded <laughs> in including our parents. And, and the reason is there's a real recognition that parents are kids' first teachers. Parents are, and, and now with the pandemic, we've seen firsthand the role that parents played supporting their kids in education. And so we need to make sure that we emphasize that same level of intentionality and deliberateness of having parents at the, at the forefront. And, you know, I often like to share, just I, I'll share a personal example of how SEL and the parent school connection is so important. My now second grader who started, who was a kindergartner when the pandemic started this particular year, he was really having a difficult transition back to school. Those, it was really August and September were really tough. And this is a kid who's academically confident, very articulate, you know, socially secure, but we noticed a shift in him at home. And then it started to play out in the classroom and that parent teacher conversation and connection of, hey, we're noticing this behavior. We're noticing that he's having, you know, challenges with this transition back to in-person. And his teacher did something that I, I mean, she was already a great teacher, but to me, well, I will forever remember. She said, you know, Aaliyah, one of the things I'm gonna focus on is my relationship with Cruz because I want Cruz to feel comfortable to come to me and talk to me about how he's feeling so that I can help him with this transition. And to me, that it was just a perfect example of her recognition of, how his social emotional development at that time period was not only impacting his academics, but also his self-confidence and his ability to regulate. And so I just think those types of partnerships between school and home are so critical. And, and so we just need to continue to engage parents in a meaningful way, not only making sure that they have a seat at the table, but a voice as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, um... I find it ironic that we even have to emphasize that. We do. And uh, that example, the, the more you can tell us these beautiful personal examples, I think the more these ideas come to life. Uh, the, the castle wheel that we so that uh, you are now the, 
in a, in a sense, the leader of uh, its promotion. The third ring of that wheel, for those of you that know it, it engages in sort of discerning or distilling some core skills, qualities, and values in the development of children, and then has these circles around that show the necessity of engaging classrooms and classroom teachers and kids in classrooms. And then the second ring, school cultures and climates and discipline strategies. And, and the third ring is families, parents, caregivers, youth serving organizations. Um, this is at the center of what good SEL is, not on the periphery, but nonetheless, you know, when things get uh, a little uh, um, distracting and politics starts to steal away ideas that uh, are used for political advantage, we have to we go back to, to grounding ourselves in these things. I think it's really important. And, and maybe in that, in that regard, Leah, maybe you could say a little bit about the first letter of the CASEL uh, acronym, collaborative. Um, this is not an organization that is typical of many organizations that set out to build their own identity. And this is one that was founded in and it continues to be grounded in this convening collaborative spirit. How does that feel? What's that feel like to you? What, what's that mean to you in this day and age? Yeah, I will say it is part of what I believe in as a leader is that collaboration. And um, as I reflect back across every stage of my career, I just organically and innately have been a firm believer in the power of collaboration. And in all my years of community work, community service, community engagement, I, 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 there's one phrase that I, I, I'm always left with of don't do anything for us without us. And I think it's so important for us to remember who we're doing and what we're doing service for so that we can be inclusive. And so to me, that's, that's what Castle being a collaborative means. It means not driving your own agenda. It means working with others to make sure that we are bringing people along. I think also the fact that um, Castle is so intentional on integrating research policy implementation and all of those components together, working collaboratively together uh, in support of social emotional learning, I think are critical. Uh, I can also say that I am committed to not only continuing to listen, but really linking arms with those collaborators because the work that lies ahead, it's going to take all hands on deck. It's going to take us pushing together, believing together, working together. And so I, the fact that it is at the fabric of who Castle is, and I can say sincerely that it's at the fabric of who I am, it just makes it even more of a natural fit. And you know, as I think about um, this, this, the collaborative and also the work ahead, I really see three key priorities that are emerging from the field. One, thinking about how are we integrating SEL across the full trajectory? We're talking early childhood, K-12, workforce, and that is going to take collaboration in order to bring all of these different systems who touch children and support children and their families together. I think we're also going to have to really be intentional on how do we improve the cultural responsiveness of SEL approaches and ensuring that it is effective and meeting kids, meeting kids needs not only you know we hear a lot about um, SEL and race, which is yes, very important, but we also need to be thinking about kids who come from rural communities and not rural communities that it's just like 10 schools in a district where it's the one room schoolhouse. I think we also need to think about students with disabilities and, and my youngest son has special health care needs and a 504 plan. How are we talking about you know, equity in, it, across all of these different subgroups? And that's gonna take collaboration and a collaborative spirit that is intentional and genuine. Also the need uh, to really elevate the partnerships between school, family, and community, and why that is so critically essential to SEL and, and bringing more voices to the table. And all three of those things <laughs> require intentional, deliberate collaboration. That is not a box that's checked, but a needle that is threaded so that the fabric of what we do is so tight um, and people can really see themselves in the work.
Sorry, I went on a little. No, I mean, I'm just very... writing. You're like a quote machine. I'm, <laughs> I'm just writing down all the things you're saying. I, maybe that's, you've said that a hundred times, not a box checked, but a needle threaded. Uh, this is a moment, right? Uh, I think it's a beautiful way of, I guess I'm just, I just, if I use it in a presentation, I just attribution, right? That's, that's all I got to do is just say, <laughs> as Dr. Leah Samuel said, it's a beautiful way of reminding us all um, uh, this, th these, these challenging points you brought up, how exciting it is to have someone who understands those points. You have, you know, uh, 1500 new best friends on this call, I think right now who will look to you now to help us all and to help each other do that threading of the needle. I wonder if you wanna say a little bit more um, uh, about you know, the issues around culture and equity. They're so important to so many people. They're so often misunderstood um, in, in, in certain quarters and, and they're so central to, to the challenge of, of, this, of this moment. How do, we, how do we be undeterred in our commitment to making sure that every child, that the, the, to the equity agenda, without losing people who who hear it and hear a distorted version of it, how do we do that? So you know, I um, someone in the chat, one of the words that they dropped in was grace, mm -hmm. and I've often said that COVID is another five letter word that really should mean grace because we all need grace now more than ever. And I think as we approach these conversations, the realities, the goal doesn't change, but what we do have to think about is the approach and how do we broker the conversation so that we use the equity conversation to unlock the doors to communication unlock the doors to at least bring a different perspective into the room, not a key that locks the door and pushes people out. And, and that's honestly why in so many ways, I feel my last two roles have been so critical, this one included, is because it takes a level of trust in operating in different rooms to be able to create that conversation. And I have been blessed to have such a wide variety of experiences that at the time that I was experiencing, I didn't understand the value of it. But being transparent about those experiences in the rooms and places and spaces where these conversations need to be had, I think are all critical pieces. Uh, I can say that I, I with everything that's going on, I knew now more than ever, it's not a time to be silent to these issues. It's not a time to, I often like to use the term, um, which a very good friend of mine coined, an equity tourist. Like we don't need tourists in this space who are just on the peripherals, but people who can really take up residency and buy the home and stay in the space and address the issues. And the reality of it is, the kids that are in the system right now are depending on it. And so when you think about the hundreds of thousands of millions of kids who are in school systems, they're depending on us. And so um, it's not an option to have the conversation. It's more so how do we think about framing the conversation? Yeah. Um, again, I have to just say um, the idea that the equity conversation can be a key to unlock communication is um, it's just so beautiful. I mean, again, I wish I, wish I could say, oh, I've heard that a hundred times, I haven't. And uh, it's a voice and it's a message that I, I think, it, you know, at least for me, it's a beautiful way of expressing both a resolute and determined commitment to equity and an openness to including everyone in the equity conversation, such a beautiful way of putting it. Um, Aliyah, I, 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 I'm tempted to, um, to ask you uh, what you want from us. I know this isn't in the script, but people are offering you, uh, you you've got yeah. hundreds of teachers, you've got program providers, you've got scholars uh, that are listening to you now, you've got policymakers, you've got your fans, you've got people who have just met you for the first time. 
or who are meeting you for the first time. Um, how can we, uh, what do you need from us? What do you need from this field, from this collective uh, assembly of talent and passion and commitment uh, that will make your life easier, that make your leadership more successful? You know, I have, it's actually um, ironically a conversation I was having with my mom who, who recently came up to visit, who really doesn't understand exactly what I do at all. So it's always interesting conversations. But fundamentally, now more than ever, we need to be intentional on how we use our voices. And in every space that we all occupy, I mean, there's you know, 1,500 folks on this call, and we each have our concentric circles of influence in places where we can use our voices to now more than ever not to be silent in those places and spaces that you also occupy. How can we, as a collaborative, share the messaging, have a consistent voice so that, it because it, it's going to take the collective and us all you know, sharing and amplifying the same stories, the same messages will, in my very optimistic world, create the re reverberations that we need from the local level to the state level to federally and right back down the line. And so I think what my ask would be, without much time to think about it, but my ask would be- <laughs> I know it's unfair how we all use our voices together to make change. And, and it, it's not easy. And I, my, one of my favorite quotes is by Art Williams. He said, he said, Art Williams, he says, I never said it would be easy. I said it would be worth it. And so all the while the road ahead might not be easy, it will 100% be worth it, especially if we're all pushing and leaning in in the places where we can. Beautiful. So that was a trick question, everyone. Uh, and you can see uh, how lucky we are uh, to have Dr. Leah Samuel. I just want to say, not on a personal note, maybe on an organizational note, uh, Leah, that um, so many people on this call uh, knew and loved and worked with Roger Weisberg. And I'm just inviting his spirit into the room now. And I just know he's just glowing um, with uh, appreciation and gratitude uh, for the way in which you've already led your life, uh, you know, just admiration for that, and also just gratitude that you're here in this room. I also, you know, your predecessor for almost a decade was Karen Nini, and I, I, I think Karen's on this call. I just want to thank Karen again, acknowledge her extraordinary leadership in being able to put Castle in a place where you can now take it to a whole new level. Um, we, we, in some ways, you know, we, in many traditions, emphasize our elders, the, the shoulders upon which we stand. And I hope you're okay with me just inviting those two people. There's so many others uh, we could invite in, uh, our, our colleague, Eric Schaps, or um, so many other people who are both with us and not with us. I've mentioned Dr. Comer, but maybe just invite all those people. I invite everyone. You mentioned your mom you know, uh, those people who have been our forebears in this work uh, and whose energy and uh, uh, spirits we need still, um, and no matter whether uh, they're in the organization formally or not. I, I hope you're okay with me bringing that uh, to the room. Absolutely. I'm a firm believer in giving honor where it's due. And um, I, could, I wholeheartedly uh, underscore the sense of gratitude uh, so much of the work that we do is just building on the work of others. And um, in, this, in this race, we all pass the baton on. And just as Karen passed the baton on to me, I hope that when my tenure is done, I can also look back and know that I've made significant impact, but I wouldn't be able to run my leg of the race the best that I can without those who laid the foundation and, and really ran those laps and did the work um, to get us here. So absolutely. And uh, I just, I would love to share my first meeting with Roger. Mm, yes. <laughs> I actually was um, 
leading a policy academy at the National Governors Association. We were working very closely with, at the time the state was Pennsylvania. So shout out to Pennsylvania if you're on the call. And um, we were wrapping up a project and Castle was just getting ready to launch the Collaborating States Initiative. And Roger called me and said, you know, I could keep hearing about this work in Pennsylvania. Can we sit down and talk? And we sat down and we talked about the development of the Collaborating States Initiative. I had, it was my first time meeting Linda Duesenberry as well. And from there, the magic just happened. And so uh, a true champion and advocate for kids. And it's just, it's an honor to continue to be able to do the work that I know he was not only passionate about, but what at the core of who he was as an individual and as a leader. Yeah. Well, the, the last few minutes we have, we have, we've gone over a little bit, Leah, but it's been worth it. Uh, we're, I'm going to try to pull a couple of quick points from the, from the Q&A box uh, here. Uh, forgive me if I botch these questions, but maybe I could start with one, uh, just because it's this, this kind of immediate and emergency set of questions. One of the questions mentions the, the outbreaks or the unacceptably high levels of crime in, affecting many of our cities, uh, many of our communities around the country, it's not just cities, um, and the burden that that places on children who are exposed to violence, children who are trying to avoid violence, parents and families who are struggling with recovering from violence. Um, have you thought or have you, you must have, uh, it must be on your con, you know, in your heart as it is on so many of us, uh, about ways in which we in the SEL field can try to offer some some support around uh, this current uh, moment in which violence seems so ever present and uh, terrifying and uh, for so many of our children, our families, our communities. Mm -hmm. So um, ironically, one of the, what I mentioned how I was traveling prior to, I was, uh, I actually traveled to Little Rock, Arkansas and Memphis, Tennessee, my very last week um, at the department and had an opportunity, particularly the, 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 the center point of the conversations in those two cities specifically was around the impact of crime uh, in their schools. And we had members from the Department of Justice with us. We actually had the police, the local police chief there, the superintendent of schools, and we were having a really intentional dialogue on not only the crime prevention programs, but how to support the families and the victims of crime as well. And one of the things, you know, that I firmly believe in is we have to consider and think about, as I mentioned earlier, SEL, mental health, and mental well-being, but also how responsive relationships, supportive environment, social emotional skills can really create a shield or a buffer for many of our children and also, well, and adults as well. And also thinking about how SEL in, in some ways can be a bridge or um, a pathway to, to really reinforcing those supports and those intervention programs and still without taking away from the need to have those additional tiered resources and responses. And, uh, you know, as we talk to this point, in these communities, one of the things that they're, and I believe is so important is by bringing all those partners together to be able to address the crime, to be able to understand the trauma, the impact of trauma, and how to um, integrate these um, different programs and interventions in a way that can still, so that, that will support communities, I think is key. And so, um, A, it goes into the collaborative nature that has to happen in order to address it, but also understanding that SEL is one component and one tool to help address um, the impacts. Yeah, it's uh, such tough uh, stuff. Uh, not new, unfortunately, but still very much on many people's minds, rightfully so. Uh, so many of us have had violence uh, transform our lives, and uh, mm -hmm. it's not something we recover from easily. And, well, we, and, we, and, yeah. and, and Tim, if I could just add one other thing that I thought was really um, incredible was the police chief 
in Little Rock, he said, what's going on right now we can't police our way out of? We have to figure out what the partnerships are to be able to support. And I think that is so true. Like we cannot police our way out of the impacts, not only of the pandemic, but for crime, but we really have to be able to provide those um, supports and interventions um, for, for this next generation. So yeah. just want to underscore that. Yeah. Um, some of the questions Aliyah have centered on, you know, the pushback that many people often hear about, you know, needing for the need for academic rigor. Uh, we don't have time for SEL. We don't have time for additions. We don't have time. We have to, with learning loss, uh, with test score challenges and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, this is not, we, this is not the right time. I, I, I it, pains me even to ask the question that way because I just want to answer it and say so you're, you're missing the point and let me not answer it how, how, how can what, what's your what's your sense of how best to respond to that concern yeah um so that's I should have said this when you asked me the questions about risk I think one of the risks we're running into is the bifurcation between SEL and academics and people feeling like we've got to do SEL we've got to do academics and right. I actually wrote um, when I was executive vice president at NWA which is an assessment organization I actually wrote a piece about <laughs> social emotional learning and academics because you can do both and as we talk about addressing learning loss we should be doing both. And so, you know, that's, that is a piece that I want to hold on to very closely and bring them together so that as we have conversations about, you know, academic recovery, um, mitigating the learning loss or le the, the learning opportunities that were missed, that we're not losing sight on the importance of relationships. And, you know, I, I again, I always mess this one up, but it's the, uh, which is, goes to show I don't know this quote too well, but it's that uh, I will never know how much you care until I, I don't care about how much you know until I know how much you care. And that's how so many of our kids, they need to know they're cared for. They need to know that they're in a safe, it, it, um, a safe environment. And so it should go hand in hand now more than ever. Yeah, it should. And, um, you know, uh, the, uh, I think the sense on the chat is that, uh, that there's a certain sense in which we know, you know, the answers to these questions. But I see a lot of other folks saying, you know, SEL is, is being, you know, uh, we're moving away from SEL in states like Florida and other states. And, you know, the, the ship is in a sense sailing, maybe um, sailing away uh, for reasons, obviously we think are misguided, but nonetheless, it's the reality many of our colleagues are facing. Um, if you were, if you could imagine sitting across the table from someone who's saying no more SEL in our district or no more uh, this kind of uh, work in our state or whatever. Um, what's, what's your version of the, of the pitch that would in, invite someone like that to reconsider? I mean, you're gonna be on the road for the next many months, maybe years of your life in this yeah. work and you've already been on the road. Uh, how do you confront those sort of naysayers or how do you engage those naysayers in a way that uh, helps that we hope can help us all move them a, a little bit? Sure. So I often like to share examples and conversations from other people so that it's not just my belief. And I want to share in one of my many trips, I had a chance to talk to an educator in Charlotte, North Carolina, veteran teacher, 35 years, really could have retired, but her love for the field is why she is not. And we were talking about where schools were in the recovery, biggest challenges, opportunities ahead. And she said to me, she said, Dr. Samuel, we have returned to school, but we haven't returned to learning because of the relationships. We have to reestablish the relationships with our students. And she said, I can't get to them academically without understanding what they're coming to me with. And I think that is what I would want people to understand is that right now, as we see kids come back, as we, even for adults, there's so much that people are dealing with. And as we talk about 
the importance of academics, we have to understand that there's more. I also think about a young woman who I met, she was a high schooler, her name was Jordan in Jacksonville, Florida. And she said, you know, Dr. Samuel, I fell behind last fall. And she said, I really didn't think I was gonna catch up. And she said, a lot of people didn't know that death was all around me. She had lost her mom, she had lost her grandmother and her aunt, all to COVID. And she said, when I got the email from my teacher telling me about missing assignments, I just kept thinking she has no idea what I'm going through. And she said, but then when I transferred classes and had a different teacher who was like, I understand what's going on. And it was the first time I had heard the term COVID orphans. And she said the compassion that she showed me, I was able to make up all of my work. And so I think really underscoring and elevating the need that you know, kids are resilient. They, they will bounce back academically with the right environments and the right um, support systems in place. And so really that would be my response. In a lot of ways, we just have to focus on holistically addressing the needs of the students. And also I don't wanna forget our educators because they're trying to teach and lead <laughs> at, while they're also experiencing so many pieces of what we've discussed today. Maybe, maybe uh, there's dozens of questions. I think most people on this webinar are like me, we'd like to go for three hours instead of one. Um, but maybe uh, that last point you made, Aaliyah, might be something we could, you could delve into a little bit more. There, there, has, there, there was a couple of years ago, people started using deliberately the language of adult SEL. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, it's one of those things where I guess we messed up early on with the language because there was always a sense in which adults needed to learn and develop these skills mm -hmm. and qualities and approaches in order to be effective at sharing them and using them in classrooms that teachers ought to be prepared with this kind of work. Most of us weren't. Uh, the vast majority of us didn't have this kind of training. Mm -hmm. uh, when we were preparing to become teachers or uh, administrators. Um, but say a little more, if you could, about your vision for teachers. H how can they uh, be more central to our vision uh, of both what they need and what they have to offer in this field, in this movement? I'll start with an alarming statistic. In the months of November and December, we lost hundred, almost 84,000 educators from the field for a variety of reasons. And these aren't teachers that are retired, they're ones that are leaving the field. And as the data is starting to come out for the reasons why they're leaving, it's stress, lack of support, lack of connection. And when we talk about the education field and the changes that are happening, we have to understand that educators are equally being impacted and their social emotional needs are, are of equal importance and impacting. And in some cases, it's a determining factor whether they're staying in the field or not. So just as we talk about kids having supportive in, uh, relationships, nurturing environments, teachers also need that. And we cannot leave our teachers behind in this conversation. Teachers have more piled on them than ever before. At the same time, they're still addressing the same, they, I mean, they're still experiencing the same things. I often think to myself, oh my gosh, if I was a principal right now, how would I be leading my school? If I was a classroom teacher, like how would I do this now? And all the while teachers are superheroes, they are not superhuman. And we have to remember the human factor of our, ed our educators. I also think because you know, education is evolving and, and you know, who knows what education will look like when we, have some, when we come out of this. I do have some ideas on reimagining education, but that's for another day. Um, we have to think about our teacher prep programs and how are we preparing teachers to successfully teach and be able to not only meet the needs of every kid, so from an equity perspective, but also uh, from social emotional learning too. Yeah, beautiful. Um, I, a lot of people have commented in the chat about the need to support teachers. This 
relational trust, relational support. So many of us, maybe all of us at differing levels, of course, but all of us have felt the dislocation, the pain, the frustration, the instability of COVID, the losses, the grief. Um, one of my uh, uh, mentors said that, you know, the greatest grief we're experiencing now, so many of us is we're grieving the loss of hope. Um, and at least to me, that cut to the heart of why this work is so important. Everybody on this call right now is a source of hope to someone, as you said earlier, the concentric circles of our influence, of our relationships, of our trust. Um, it is, it, there's no other group in, in our country, in my view, who can uh, restore hope in our children and our families in the future other than our educators. I mean, it's just not gonna come elsewhere from elsewhere. I'm sorry to say, maybe it's too much of a burden, but it's a, it's a wonderful uh, moment, I feel like, to look to you now uh, to be uh, a, uh, a beacon for all of us to help us restore hope uh, in each other, uh, in, in our schools, in our children, uh, in the future. And um, I think this has been an extraordinary moment to do that. I, you know, that when we talked about this before, I was going to try to summarize now. I, 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 I've got so many quotes here, but I guess maybe my only summary point that for all of us, you know, everyone can summarize themselves. Maybe I can invite people to put in the chat their summaries. Um, but I just feel like, Aaliyah, you've, you've, you've invited us to think about equity in a new way. You've invited us to think about education itself in a new way. You've invited us to think about parents and families in a new way. You've invited us to think about policymakers and their discussions with them in a new way. You've invited us and reminded us this is not a box checked, but a needle threaded. I think I got that right. That equity can open communications, can be a tool to unlock communications for the future. But what I've heard over and over again, whether you're talking about your own children or you, and your mom or the students you taught or the educators in the field is the power and importance and primacy of relationships. And if we do better in that work, it seems to me you're telling us we'll do better in all the rest. I'll leave the last uh, few minutes to you. Thank you, Tim. I will tell you as I am on a walk or sometimes on a drive, I often do think about where is the impact that we need to have both now and also in the future. And if there's anything that I think I, I hope to elevate is from a parent perspective, I'll go back to my three Ps, the importance now of our voice and our advocacy for what's best for our kids in schools. And there's not a parent who doesn't care about their kids' social emotional development and academics. And SEL can do both. I'll also go into, from a practitioner's perspective, my call to support our school personnel now more than ever. And the reason why I'm saying school personnel and not teachers specifically is because there are counselors, teachers, bus drivers, uh, food nutrition staff, that front office manager, all who are touching our kids and our educators in so many ways, and they need our support as well. And they're also critical to that school climate and culture, which we know are also foundational. And then I think for our policymakers, as a policy influencer, my plea would just be to listen to your constituents and, and really not the few that may be the loudest, but really take the time. And I know it's hard because for many policy makers, you know, pre-pandemic, they're used to seeing people at the grocery store, they would have convenings and events. And so it's harder to have that intentional and sometimes unintentional, unintentional interactions with your constituents but really let's broaden the aperture of the voices that we're hearing. So it's not just a singular vision or voice that's being heard. And so uh, I think I'll end with my three Ps the same way I started. And, you know, as the new CEO and president, I would be remiss without putting a plug for our 10 part series on systemic social and emotional learning, which will come be coming out soon. And with that, honestly, it is an honor. Um, thank you, Tim, for your time.